Welcome to the Tom Nelson Podcast. I have Godfrey Bloom here to talk about uh, climate, maybe some energy. I'm very happy to have him here. And uh, would you like to introduce yourself and to get us started? Uh, sure, yes. And thank you very much for having me on your show. I was uh, a member of the European Parliament for 10 years. <clears throat> and part of that time, I sat on the Environmental Committee. Uh, so I have some, uh, inf some knowledge of the belly of the beast, as it were. Uh, and I am a retired city man. I was in the City of London in investment finance for 40 years. And I finished my career, believe it or not, as the chief executive of a life insurance company. So I am trained and qualified in the interpretation of data and the assessment of risk. Uh, and so that's what I do for a living. Or, or did do for many, many years for a living, uh, and assessing the information that is to hand. Uh, and that's what brought me uh, to climate skepticism. Okay. And you have been a climate skeptic for a long time, or how long do you think, uh, when you started speaking out about it, when was that? Well, <clears throat> uh, when I started in politics, um, which I'm not a politician by trade, okay. uh, I came to politics for other reasons, Okay. Um, but not to be a journeyman politician or professional politician. Uh, and in, in 2003 or four, I think it was, when I was seconded onto the Environment Committee with a lot of very, very bright people at my uh, side mm -hmm. in my research team, one of whom I think you know, Ben Pyle. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, wor I worked with Ben, uh, who's got a very, very good mind uh, yes. when it comes to these matters. <clears throat> and funnily enough, it was Ben... Uh, who I met at York University when I was giving a talk there and we got together and uh, when he left university he came to work for me he was the first person that actually and I always thought I was quite a bright sharp fellow you know but he had to point out to me that this whole thing was politically driven ah, okay I was trying to find out why people believed that there was some kind of cl climate emergency or global warming as we were calling it then I mm -hmm. couldn't understand it and he pointed out, uh, dummy, that it's political. It's got nothing to do with science at all. <clears throat> and so I picked up on that very quickly because then it made sense because it wasn't making sense then to me. And that was quite fascinating. Uh, and so I actually put out what in the army we used to call a Charlie Charlie call. That's to everybody, oh, anybody okay. who might be listening uh, mm -hmm. in the parliament, in the research departments, anywhere at all. Um, the Charlie Charlie call was can anybody show me definitive data to show a correlation between atmospheric carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and global warming? And the, I put out a sort of a, a, it was a thousand dollar prize, I think I put out or something of that nature is a long while ago now, I can't remember, but something that was a good prize. Okay. And bear in mind that the European Parliament has something in the region of 10,000 researchers in various fields. Nobody won the prize because nobody could show me a correlation between atmospheric carbon dioxide, never mind man-made carbon dioxide, and global warming. And then, of course, they stopped calling it global warming. They called it climate change because it quite clearly wasn't warming. Uh, but, of course, being political, there's a huge propaganda dynamic involved in this. And all mainstream media are going with it. The I don't know about America particularly, but certainly in this country, it's relentless. Mm -hmm. Sky yeah. and BBC, it's relentless. Every day there are programs running, showing all sorts of things which, of course, are fake. One the other day, I live in a rural community, and as an ex-dairy farming guy or farming guy, you'd know, mm -hmm. we've had a warm spell. We've had a warm summer. We've had a lovely, lovely summer. been very nice and sunny, which we don't often get, to be honest. Okay. Um, and so we had this one for warm summer and they were the spinning, the BBC and Sky was spinning and the newspapers were spinning. What a dreadful drought we'd had, how terrible it's been. And we've got more of this to come because it's been a terrible summer. Now, most Englishmen think if we've had a sunny summer, we think that's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't think it's terrible at all. And then here's the key. Here's the funny thing. And this happens all the time. They were showing pictures, aerial pictures of cornfields which had been harvested <laughs> which were brown <laughs> or yellow well they would be wouldn't they the shocker yeah so everybody in the towns which is where most people live go oh lord you know <laughs> goodness wow. me look at that 
There has right. never been in history a field that's been harvested from corn that doesn't turn yellow or brown, right. all right? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. So Amazing. we've got this, and then there's pictures of, 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 of crumbling ice and people saying that, you know, that, that North Sea ice is going to disappear completely and that the Antarctic is going to sort of, the ice is melting, and none of which is true. None of which is true. Um, um, but we have celebrities. We have celebrities. So we have Harrison Ford, for example, telling us to, you know, follow the science. I mean, the guy's a moron, isn't he? He's a moron. Uh, then yeah. we have Emma Thompson, our own celebrity yeah. actress, mm -hmm. who attends climate conferences. She flies first class British Airways for a weekend and then all the way back again to worry about the climate. Mm -hmm. She's another idiot. We have John Kerry, who goes everywhere in a private jet, mm -hmm. worrying right. about climate. We have the Prince of Wales, or what? He's the King, King yeah. Charles III now, mm -hmm. who's a very impressionable young man, or well, old man now he is, of course. Um, uh, who really isn't very bright, uh, to be brutally frank. He's just not very bright and he's impressionable. He's surrounded by sycophants. He's looking for a role in life, mm -hmm. uh, which a, being a Prince of Wales really didn't give him. So he's worried about climate change and it's all going to be an emergency and we're all going to die. I've been listening to this for 30 years. I've been listening to this for 30 mm -hmm. years. And I'm old enough to remember in the 1970s, before the 30-year mm -hmm. global warming period, there was a new ice age coming. Right. Don't we love something to worry about? Yes. The yes. fact that you've all got to do is look out of the bloody window. You know, it's not <laughs> happening. 30 years of it. My next door neighbor on the next day, they planted exotic plants because they thought global warming, they'd oh. all grow in their garden in Yorkshire. They're all dead now. Okay. Oh, we have to listen yeah. to this little Swedish girl, the, the little Swedish pixie. Who knows all about it? Right. She, she reads it off a teleprompt. You know, and people take her seriously. I've seen English cabinet ministers clapping her speech. Yes. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. throw me a herring. <laughs> These sort of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it's political. It's political. And it is a system of control. It's a system of taxation. Uh, and it's got all these ingredients that we thought had gone with the Roman Catholic Church in the period yes. of the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. You know, this is going to happen, but we can save you if yes. you do as you're told and give us money. And mm -hmm. here we are, right back again. Nothing changes. Plus, I change. You know, we're back there now with politicians saying, we're all going to die unless you stop driving your cars, uh, you don't uh, heat your homes, uh, you know, you stay at home and you're a good little... You're a good little citizen, and we're going to give you a little card. So if you're a naughty little citizen, you won't be able to travel, you won't be able to do anything that you want to do in a free society. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem, Tom. 80% mm -hmm. of the population, 80% of the electorate are also morons. Uh -huh. So consequently, they sit down, they watch the television, <clears throat> probably only half watching the TV, doing something else at the time, eating their tea, or doing the ironing, or whatever they do, and they're half watching. So most people believe that there's a climate emergency. If you ask them why and on what basis did they make that statement, uh, they wouldn't be able to tell you. They have no idea. But this propaganda now has been ruthless and never-ending now for long enough. And, of course, Goebbels, who was the master of propaganda, said, you have to repeat a simple lie often enough until it becomes an accepted truth and it has to be based on emotion. You can't deal in facts with these people. You have to deal on emotion. Uh, and emotion is the key. And fear, of course, fear, of course, is the most potent emotion. And we've seen that with COVID. Uh, you get everybody absolutely terrified that they're going to die a horrible death, regardless of the numbers, which don't bear it out in the slightest bit. Regardless of the numbers, we're all going to die a terrible death unless you submit to experimental spike protein therapy. Uh, and boy, have we got the shot for you. Uh, and uh, it's, it's free to you. <laughs> it's free to you. Right. It's not free at all, really. Uh, mm -hmm. So we see how this is going. We see how this is developing. And only really, I think you'll agree, uh, Tom, only quite recently have we seen a pushback. 
it's only just starting to happen. It's still not happening on mainstream media. Mm -hmm. It's still not happening on mainstream. Nobody's really challenging right. the hypothesis that carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere is going to produce a terrifying change uh, in our weather. And of course, climate change has been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, climates, we know that, you know, we know that. Everybody knows, every schoolboy knows that the climates have changed backwards and forwards over millions of years. And even in what I would call relatively modern ge ge geological history, uh, which is mankind, if you will, if you go back to the Minoan Warm period, there was a Minoan Warm period, uh, there was a Roman Warm period, a Middle Ages Warm period, there was a mini ice age here in the 1600s, mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth. It's just, it's always been changing. It's always been changing. Uh, and this uh, fatuous argument that somehow now it's warmer than it was in the Roman warm period, or but it's just ludicrous. You've only got to visit Hadrian's Wall, uh, with the wall between Scotland and England. I'd build it again if I had my way, but leaving that one aside, um, you can see they grew vines there, they grew grapes there, that it was much warmer. But people think because a temperature has been recorded in our hot summer this year, in the middle of a city with all the concrete yeah. and glass mm -hmm. around it mm -hmm. that it's the highest ever but it wouldn't be the highest ever if you stuck it in a field if you put the thermometer in right, a field right. but mm -hmm. people believe it oh we've had the you know it's happening they think it's happening of course it's not happening at all really gullible people are just gullible aren't they they are so the politicians that are pushing it what is your uh, idea of what's going on in their mind do Almost all of them actually believe that there's an emergency, or do they know well and good that what they're pushing is just a scam? I'm curious. The cannon fodder in politics believes it. I worked for a very posh investment bank in the city uh, for years, and everybody there was really seriously bright. Uh, okay. Everybody was either Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, Sorbonne, Heidelberg, Everybody there was super sharp, very highly paid. And if you didn't perform, you were out the door. So it was a very, very meritocratic um, kind of environment to be in. And very very exciting, very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and I loved it. I don't know how I got into it. To, <laughs> I don't know why they recruited me, uh, but anyway, <laughs> I was part of that. It was fantastic. And my first appearance in politics was age uh, I think I was 50, no, 55, Okay, 55, because I wanted to go in for Brexit. I wanted Brexit. So I joined, uh, uh, I started a political party or co-started a political party at, right in the very beginning to take us out of the European Union that and, and restore our parliamentary democracy and our constitutional monarchy. That's why I went into politics. And as soon as that was achieved, I came out of politics. So that was the reason I went into politics. Mm -hmm. But what was a key thing? What was a key thing, and I was absolutely staggered, I thought when I went into politics, it was like going behind the green baize door and there'll be all sorts of things that I didn't know. And there was a reason that these uh, people said that or did that. There was, a, and, and the scales were, and I say, oh, now I understand. Now I understand why you do and say these things. You've just given me information that shows I just didn't know that. Mm -hmm. and now I know that. I can understand how clever and right you all are. That didn't happen. I went behind the green baize door and I found nothing but morons. Mm -hmm. The average politician in a democracy is utterly hopeless. Uh, they have no life experience at all. They've never done a real job. They haven't even been a cab driver or a barman. I'm sure you know, and you all agree with me over there in America, your average cab driver is much brighter than your average politician. Yeah, I would. Uh, they'd be yeah, I part of the wealth creating sector. Uh, and they don't, but they don't go into politics. People go into politics because they're widows. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, people go into politics for a profession, as a profession, are weird. Um, they are sociopaths in the main. There are some psychopaths, but mainly sociopaths. Um, and they're very odd people indeed. And I found out very odd they are. And if that is the group thing, if climate emergency yeah. is the group thing mm -hmm. and coming outside the pack, you know, associate, they don't associate, they associate with the pack. They don't associate with Galileo or Nicholas Copernicus 
or Albert Einstein. They, they don't think like that. They want to be in the herd because being the herd for a politician, the herd is the safest place because they're bovines. Uh, and uh, so you don't get any critical thinking. And critical thinking isn't discussed in our school system or educational system at all. I'm sure America is the same. Yes, it is. Yeah. No critical thinking. We are not trained uh, in a platonic or Socratic way uh, that we should question things. Just a minute. Why did why did you say that? Uh, you know, uh, why, why did the chemistry master or the biology master or the physics say we've got to reduce our carbon footprint in a class? Why doesn't everybody say why? Yes. Yeah. Uh, flick some graphs up, flick some data up onto the screen, all right, and tell me why. Because I can't see it. I don't understand it. It doesn't seem like that's happening to me. Uh, the way you're discussing it doesn't seem to be happening. But you are in front of the class. Prove to me that you're right. Don't just say, don't mm -hmm. think I'm going to accept that because you say so. Right. But I, we I, do, don't we? As a, as, yeah. as a nation, as an electorate. Yes, yeah. Uh, I do have a follow-up question. When you were in the private sector with all those smart people, did climate change come up much? And what, what were people saying? Uh, they, I went into private consultancy in 1992, so it wasn't a front okay. burner issue. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that sadly that didn't come about. But just to let you know, one of the, one of the reasons it came into politics latterly in life, I was heading up a fixed interest desk. So I was managing fixed interest which of course okay. was about currencies and interest rates and so on and so forth. And I was asked before we joined the Euro, or before the Euro came into being uh, in, the, in, in, in the early 1990s, we knew it was coming and they wanted me to look at this with my team. I had a very bright team, statisticians and mathematicians from Cambridge University, all sorts, ladies mainly, uh, bonnie ladies as well, I might say. Uh, so uh, we all got together on this. Uh, and we were given a two month project. It was only a couple of weeks before we realized it was futile. It was hopeless. It couldn't possibly work. You couldn't have uh, you couldn't have the same currency, and the same interest rates for Portugal and Greece and Germany. It was ludicrous to even suggest it. And of course, now we've seen uh, uh, it's still in being, but it's on life support. It's been on life support now for decades. So you have massive debt, massive unemployment in the Mediterranean basin. And now, of course, the Germans are feeling the pinch as well for different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, when they understand how they've been conned when they get got rid of the Deutschmark. But that's the reason I went in. So it would have been an analytical. I worked in an analytical environment. So it wouldn't have been long, I think, before the those people would have said, just a minute, this simply isn't happening. There is no scientific base. But, and here's a but, it's the same, uh, another very prestigious, wrongly prestigious bank, mm -hmm. Goldman, Goldman Sachs, for example. Yes. Nobody in Goldman Sachs would suggest for a moment that there wasn't a climate emergency. Not because they believe it, it's because they see it as an almighty scam to make money. Yes. on carbon and carbon futures and all the sorts of clever stuff that they can get up to in their hedge funds and their call options and their put options, so on and so forth. It's a nice thing to have uh, at your elbow. Uh, so nobody would dare speak out of it. And if you did speak out of, uh, about it, I suspect you wouldn't last very long at Goldman Sachs. Okay. Yeah, there's enormous amounts of money to be made in the climate scam. And there's basically no money to be made in climate skepticism. Would you, would you exactly. agree? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, what do you think we can do as uh, unpaid climate skeptics? And uh, a lot of us will be listening to this. What can we do to uh, help spread the word and uh, turn this scam around or expose it? Um, it's very difficult. I've just been reading a I've just been reading a book on uh, on reason, reasoning, and psychology, and so on and so forth. And and, and they've taken me down a sort of a bit of a rabbit hole. Okay. Uh, because that wasn't my field, but I. I have been wondering why people believe things, why people are behaving in a totally irrational manner. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine, a very old friend of long standing, who's a district judge, uh, who is paid by the state to assess evidence, who believes that we should all immediately stop using fossil fuels, and he's bought an electric car. Now this man is a judge, he's, he's trained and paid to assess evidence with clearly no intention of so doing because he's very woke, uh, he's very green, uh, mm -hmm. and that's the world he lives in and his dinner parties with his roasted aubergines and his roast voles liver in a raspberry juice washed down with a 
cheeky little Chardonnay. That's his sort of pathetic world. There's mm -hmm. nothing more stupid, believe me, than the English middle class. They are unbelievably stupid. Now, your real expertise, your, your, your people who really know what's going on, are your artisans, what we used to call perhaps the artisan class. We've just had a little cottage restored on our small holding. And so we've had uh, sparkies, uh, we've had chippies, uh, we've had plasterers, painters. All these guys come to actually can do a real job, unlike me. <laughs> they could actually do something in it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They put shelves up and they bang holes in things. They're all terribly skilled craftsmen. And you can't fool them. They don't believe a word of all this bullshit. They don't believe a world, uh, a word about it. That makes me happy. Uh, I love hearing that. Yeah, because so the I was making this point to Ben Pyle the other day, actually. I believe your grassroots are your artisan classes, or you probably call them, I don't know, maybe they're blue, blue collar, yeah, Joe yeah. six pack. Mm -hmm. yep, uh, yep. People with common sense. As an ex-soldier a long time ago, I would call them the sergeant's mess. The sergeant's mess is where you get the common sense, not the officer's mess. The oh, sergeant's yeah. mess. Yeah. You had to have common sense and ability to get into the sergeant's mess. Mm -hmm. Not quite as oh. difficult to get into the officer's mess, I know, because I was an officer. Richard Lindsay. Make me a sergeant. <laughs> Richard Lindsay has some a great quote about how um, highly edu educated people are the most easy to fool on this issue. That it's it's harder to fool the uh, the people who have real jobs and have to get stuff done in the real world. But if you live in an academic world and you believe in models, etc., I think it's easier to fool those people. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Yes, uh, we have uh, mathematical models. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, the Imperial College London has a guy called Neil Ferguson, not the other Neil Ferguson from oh. Jesus College Oxford, of course you all know. Um, he's been working on mathematical projections for years the bbc and the politicians soak it up like a sponge he's been right wrong for his entire professional yes. career mm -hmm. entire professional it's difficult even a clock is right broken clocks right twice a day this guy is consistently amazingly mm -hmm. wrong uh, but he is held in great high esteem because mathematical models are always wrong uh, and as, as Mises uh, 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 said, to quote Mises, it's human action. It, mathematical mo models don't allow for human action. So now here's an interesting thing in the financial world. If you did that, it would be illegal. If, for example, uh, let's say my fund made 10% last year when I was managing money. Let's say it made 10% last year. Yeah. I could then put a slide up and say, if it does this until your retirement date, because it was mainly pension fund money, uh, your fund will be worth a billion pounds, mm -hmm. you know, by or a billion dollars right. by the time you retire at 65. Now, that is illegal. I couldn't oh. do that. Okay. That would be a mathematical model for projecting the stock market or my fund or bonds or whatever you like, okay. taking one year and propelling it over the next 30. It's illegal. But you can do it with COVID, you can do it with climate. That's perfectly all right. And of course, because they bought into the they bought into the game, the presenters on TV, who most of whom I've met in this country, fascinating, equally stupid. Some of the most stupid people actually in front of a team interviewing people. But you know that already. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> they don't say, well, why should we believe you? Because you've been on this program now three times in the last five years and you've been wrong on every occasion. That's a sort of question you would ask, isn't it? It That's is, the sort yeah. of question I would ask. <laughs> but they don't. They go, gosh, isn't that terrible? What right. can we do? And then, of course, the guy says, you just have to close down the country, <clears throat> which, okay. of course, we did. Lockdown. Yeah. We closed down the country. We closed down the country, which crucified our economy. We're now picking up the tab for it. And our chancellor, who was just running for being prime minister, Rishi Sunak, said, Oh, well, yeah, we listened to all these scientists and they persuaded us that we had to do this and we had to do that. A complete abrogation of responsibility. <clears throat> A complete abrogation of responsibility. Sunak was elected. Sunak was made the chance of the exchequer. It was him to call the shots. The buck stopped with Sunak, right? You can't yeah. suddenly say, oh, it's all a mistake and blame somebody else at the last minute. It won't happen again. <clears throat> you can't do that. But they try and do that. But nobody bought it because Sunak didn't get the job. He was ex-Goldman Sachs. 
incidentally. Oh. So every by the way, bad, bad guy you meet is ex Goldman yeah. Sachs. <laughs> Uh, just by the way, isn't there uh, some new uh, people at Great Britain News and maybe they have some people that would ask those questions about why have you been wrong? It seems like I'm seeing climate skepticism on there that I uh, am not seeing elsewhere. I'm loving that. Uh. GB News is very good and they're going in the right direction. <clears throat> they haven't okay. totally committed but because okay. we have something called Ofcom, okay. <clears throat> which can close them down. Okay. Ofcom is the establishment. Ofcom is the government. Oh. So if they talk about too much about climate change being or climate oh. skepticism or, or vaccine skepticism, whatever, they've already been investigated. They're already talking about closing it down. Really? Okay. Yes. The reason <clears throat> the reason that there's been no reform of the BBC, which was promised by various political parties, there's been no reform, is because the BBC put out the government line always. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter which government it is. So governments can't afford to antagonize the BBC. And this is one of the problems that we have. You, you, you really can't go. You, dissent is not, not allowed. They go to the wire, GP News. They go to the wire, and God yeah. bless them for doing that. But they've still got rather a long way to go. But it's difficult if you're under threat of being closed down every day. Yes, okay. The big one, of course, is what, what we can do about it. Um, yeah. There is no climate skeptic newspaper. Okay. Uh, th there is a degree of skepticism now about everything people will see on television that they know to be untrue. Uh, <clears throat> people are politically homeless. Um, the working man in this country is politically homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a chippy or a bricky or something, <clears throat> there's nobody for you to vote for because all the parties are the same. They're all Democrats uh, or Republicans in your case. Yes, yep. There really isn't much difference. <clears throat> and there's no much difference over here between a, a conservative government and a Labour government. It's all smoke and mirrors. But here is where a breakthrough could come in my view. I wrote an article uh, on my, it's on my, uh, it's on my website, but it was okay. for a magazine. It was a little while ago. And it was America really ever really united um, because I think there's a very big question mark uh, over whether the United States is actually really united or indeed was it ever so this is something that I was looking at for that article or I've looked again when I see things like uh, and I know it's something that you do at your peril is to criti criticize Abraham Lincoln in America. Huh? You know, that is something that will get you lynched immediately. <laughs> um, but whenever I see Lincoln saved the Union or Lincoln preserved the Union. Now, he didn't. Okay. He didn't. He enforced the Union. He enforced the Union at Bayonet Point which is never the idea in 1776. That was okay. not the idea. Mm -hmm. The idea that states could come and go as they like, run their own lives with some pooled authority for, the, for Washington and, and, and federalism in order for the common good, uh, so, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now it's gone far too much. Now, who's pushing back in America? Well, of course, the governor of Florida, yes. uh, the governor of South Dakota, uh, people are leaving California in big numbers to go to Texas, where the tax burden uh, isn't so strong. Uh, if you look at the cities, I know enough about American cities to know if you go to a blue city, it's a shit heap. Uh, and uh, uh, the red cities are much better uh, because the Democrats don't know how to actually run anything. Uh, in the same way over here, the Labour Party is the same. If you go to local government, you could go to a town, you can tell which one is run by the Labour government because okay. it's a shit hole. Uh, and if you go to one that's run by the Conservatives locally, it's very much better, cleaner, tidier, lower crime, so on and so forth. So you have these dynamics and it's possible, uh, it's possible, and you'd know and your viewers will know very much more about this than me, um, <clears throat> whether people, it will get to the stage where people want to move to those states where there is a more libertarian, less authoritarian, more yeah. prosperous, lower tax environment and if that happens in any great measure one might imagine that other states would go we're now going to have to adopt that or people would change their voting habits uh you know these kind of things might happen i think there is there is a future there is a better future 
but I think it's probably going to have to get worse before it gets better. Probably right. Uh, that is a sad thing. It's going to have to get worse before it gets better. And the problem is, of course, if we look at history, we know that when you have a collapse, whether it's a currency collapse mm -hmm. or whatever kind of social collapse that you have, libertarianism doesn't follow. They think, in spite of the fact they know government caused the collapse, they think the solution that there wasn't enough government. Yes, yeah. And if you go back to the French Revolution, of course, uh, the French Revolution brought what was known as the terror, uh, and everybody chopped everybody else's heads on, even themselves. And sooner or later, a strong man took over in the shape of Napoleon, uh, who was a far more autocratic emperor, mm -hmm. authoritarian emperor, uh, than the previous king ever was. So that's the way it swung. And we saw, did we not, uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917 produced Stalin. So that's one of the things uh, we, we saw. We saw communism. We saw the collapse of the Weimar Republic and we saw Hitler yes, and the, the yeah. Nazis. Uh, we saw the civil war in Spain, which produced fascism. Uh, all these things, sadly, don't lead back to the freedom which should be protected by our constitution, <clears throat> your constitution, mm -hmm. our constitution, which are very similar things. A lot of people don't understand this on both sides of the Atlantic, in my experience. The, one of the reasons in, in 1776 that the Americans decided that they wanted to go it alone, the jury is still out on that, incidentally, in my view, but there we are. <laughs> um, they weren't getting the protection of the Bill of Rights of 1688 that was getting we were getting in the protections and the, uh, and the law that we were getting enjoying uh, in Great Britain mm -hmm. and England. And so that's what they wanted. And so when the dra they drafted the Constitution, it was very much along the lines of the Bill of Rights and the Toleration Acts of, uh, of 1688 and 1689. And of course, as, as, as your viewers will know, because they'll be more informed, otherwise they wouldn't be watching your programme. Right. Um, this is the problem. We're always preaching to the choir in these things. But of course, there is a fair copy of Magna Carta mm -hmm. uh, in Washington. Uh, so the roots of this go back uh, quite a long way. And of course, if you go back to Magna Carta, which was 1215, it goes back even further. But of course, that was only really an amalgamation and a reinstitution of Anglo-Saxon law, which was two or three hundred years old. Even then, the concept of natural justice, which was good enough for the Normans when they invaded, the Normans invaded and they actually adopted what uh, judicial precedent, local law, natural justice, which was an Anglo-Saxon concept. Now, we've had that, and you've had that on your side of the pond up until relatively recently. Uh, relatively recently. We had it until probably uh, the uh, 1970s when we started to abandon the principles of law with things like enabling acts, and then we joined the European Union, which actually sidelined Parliament and sidelined side British law. In America, they've sidelined side -lined the Constitution and politicize the judiciary, as indeed we have here. So consequently, you've lost the protection of your constitution, and we've lost the protection of our unwritten constitution, which was equally strong nevertheless. And when it comes right back to climate, if you're talking about climate uh, change and all the rest of it, all the things that are being enacted are actually against our constitution. Uh, you know, the, 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 but they get away with this because they say, yes, I know, we've got a constitution, but we're putting it aside. For the time being, yes, we know we've got principles of English law, but we're setting aside because if we don't, we're all going to die. Okay. And when yeah. they were written, when they were written, we didn't realize that we we're all going to die mm -hmm. right. unless, <laughs> unless, of course, we do as exact as we're told. Uh, and this is one of the problems that we have. We have very good systems of law in America and, and Britain. Um, they're joined at the hip, uh, and we should be being protected by them. But of course, as you know. The school kids today in America and, 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 and Great Britain, they're not, they're not really trained in the principles of law, uh, what their constitution says, oh, no. the inherited freedom, libertarianism. Um, <clears throat> they, they don't understand these things. Critical thinking, uh, risk assessment. I did a podcast on risk, ass risk assessment um, a little while ago, which was quite an interesting thing because being, being an underwriter for life assurance, 
see a senior uh, chief executive of a life insurance company and i started on the floor at lloyd's of london okay. that's where i started my career <clears throat> all about risk assessment now this is a really odd situation here is it not where you have a bug let's call it just a bug for want of argument a bug from which the average healthy person over 70 years of old 70 years old has a 99 percent chance of recovery why would you have an experimental spike protein therapy injection to counter something which you will not die from it's not ebola it's not smallpox it's not going to kill you it's going to put you in bed for a couple of weeks and feeling rotten i've had it incidentally mm -hmm. and i felt rotten okay. for nearly two weeks i was absolutely bloody rotten now i've got my natural immune system has taken over and that's there and now i'm i'm fine good okay. You know, I'm not now worried about, oh, my God, I've got to have booster, booster, booster and all this kind of thing. Risk assessment. And yet now here's an interesting thing, is it not? Everybody makes a risk assessment every day, don't they? You're overtaking something in the car. There's a tractor and trailer. You look ahead. You see the road. <clears throat> is it safe to go? Yes, I'll overtake now. It's not on a blind bend. It's not on a brow of the hill. Mm -hmm. Right. Some people, of course, do because they're stupid. Right. Uh, you make a risk assessment. Uh, whatever you do, you go on holiday, you make a risk assessment, whether it's weather, whether it's the airline, uh, whether it's a budget hotel, there's a risk assessment here. Is that going to balance out? Risk assessments, the ordinary ordinary Joe, six pack, and man, our man on the Clapham omnibus, makes a risk assessment several times every day. Yes. Yep. But as soon as it comes to whether it's climate or whether it's COVID, he throws that risk assessment out of the window. Mm -hmm. Good point. Against all the evidence, against all common sense, he abandons it. Uh, and that is something which is why I've been trying to read up psychologically on all this. Um, okay. And it, it, the statistics are a little, a little bit vague, but apparently 30% of people will go with groupthink. Uh, and the other, an, an, another 50% of people will go along with the flow because they don't want to dissent on anything. Yes, they go yeah. with the flow. Mm -hmm. Most people go with the flow. That only leaves 20% of the electorate to say, just a minute, what's going on? This is bullshit. Right. There aren't enough of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and of course, if they're watching stacked propaganda TV, they're getting the same message all the time. Yes, yes. And it's difficult for somebody who hasn't made a study of it. I mean, I only made a... I, suppose, I would have eventually come to study it anyway. It was only because I was dicked with the bloody environment committee which i didn't want they put me okay. on the environment committee but i thought well, i'm going to do it which is why i recruited ben Pyle. okay and you know i recruited him to say look i don't know much about this can you put me right you know, where are we going with this and of course like a rabbit hole once you delve down it's like bitcoin once you own bitcoin yes. you become an expert on bitcoin because you've got it and what the americans say and it's a beautiful phrase you've got skin in the game yes yeah and that's and the same with gold if people suddenly Get the gold. They suddenly start buying gold to protect their investment, you know, gold coins or gold bars or whatever. Suddenly, it doesn't take more than a few months before they're an expert in gold. They yes. really are mm -hmm. because they got it and mm -hmm. you really understand it. It's not academic. It's not theory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, people would. And th this is going to come. Th this is going to come because as we've shot ourselves to the foot in this country on our uh, sanctions against Russia. Mm. Uh, so we're now experiencing, experiencing increased uh, gas prices, increased fertilizer, uh, in increased uh, gasoline prices and all these kinds of things. But we know, we, we know that. Uh, but of course, we've also had something like 15 years of green politics. Yes. So we've closed our conventional power stations. We've got one down the road. They actually they've actually blown them up. We heard the explosion two weeks ago. It was a big explosion. They blew really? that one up. They blew one down in Kings, Kingsville in Kent. They blew that one up. I can see from a window here, Drax Power Station, which is one of the biggest, oh, was the biggest conventional power station mm -hmm. in Europe. And they boast about how they're doing this and they're doing that. And they're going to save the planet and all this kind of stuff. It's their major boast. Now, here's an interesting thing. They, it was coal fired because coal is underneath the power station, the Yorkshire coal mm -hmm. fields. So all you did was you dig coal out of the ground. <laughs> And you put it in the thing, which meant cheap electricity. And it was clean uh, because the, the carbon monoxide or the sulfur, sulfur that comes out of that was all out. All you can see coming out of them is steam. 
from the cooling towers. And people go, oh, look at that pollution. It's steam, <laughs> all right? But people are stupid. Mm -hmm. Now, the government gave them billions of pounds to convert to wood burning. Yes. We now found out that wood burning is a bad thing. But it's a bit late now. They've converted to wood. We now buy wood from the other side of the world, mm -hmm. yeah. which is transported on boats powered by diesel oil, then onto trains powered by diesel oil to burn inefficiently at Drax. So inefficiently that the government has to give them two million pounds a day <clears throat> to keep operating. Otherwise, they'd be out of business. Now, this is sheer lunacy. Burning trees and then pretending you're green. We're going to save the planet. You're burning trees from the other side of the world. And yeah. when it's cold, we've got 100 years of gas uh, under Lancashire. We don't talk much about Lancashire and Yorkshire. We don't like them very much. We don't hate them as much as Londoners. Okay. But in Lancashire, they've got 100 years of gas underneath, which we could frack. <clears throat> Just drink a hole down there and bring it up. The government has been stopping that happening now for 10 years <clears throat> because the Green Lobby have told them that it will create earthquakes and pollute all the water. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. And this is the problem that we have. The Green Lobby. Nobody votes Green in this country. We have a Green Party like they have in Germany. They have one seat. Okay. And it's Brighton, which is full of druggies, hippies and all sorts of idiot lunatics. So nobody votes Green, but we've got Green. And why have we got Green politics? We've got green politics because Boris Johnson's wife is a greenie. She's a big greenie. She tells him what to do. If he doesn't go green, there's no nookie. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. All right. And it was the same before him, David Cameron. Samantha, his wife, was a greenie. Same again. No greenie, no nookie. So the pe people we actually vote for going to number 10 Downing Street aren't governing us at all. <clears throat> They're getting their instructions from their wife and when it's not the wife it's the world economic forum that's telling them what to do okay. <clears throat> and this is the way uh, this is the way the thing works the world economic forum tell uh, the prince of wales as he then was now king charles the mm -hmm. tell him what to do uh, it's quite open about it he makes speeches at the world economic forum mm -hmm. he's been seen with klaus schwab the son now is the Prince of Wales. He's exactly the same. <clears throat> okay. So we don't have a king that's going to be ruling us in the interests of his subjects. We have a king who takes his orders from a rather crazed German. Well, I thought we won, you know. <laughs> Obviously, we didn't. Um, oh. But this is absolutely catastrophic, and it's going to get worse because he's a very gullible and suggestible individual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, he's going to lend his prestige and his weight and his enormous fortune to it uh, and this is something else and uh, whether he believes it I think he probably does believe yeah mm -hmm. he's a believer uh, he isn't a, a chance he can't make any more money he's one of the richest men in the world anyway so it's not a question of money for him it's a question of really trying to fold find a, a role in life and okay. climate, climate change has become a pseudo religion. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and here's an interesting hypothesis. And that is, as the West becomes more secular, uh, fewer and fewer people go to church in this country. It's restricted to your Bible belt and bits and pieces there where it's still strong. But broadly mm. speaking, we seem to live in a secular society. If you take that belief away from people, it's my belief that humans need some belief system. <clears throat> it could be Islam, it could be Hinduism, it could be Catholicism, it could be, mm -hmm. it could be a belief system that they need. It seems the human soul craves a belief system, which is why we have such eccentric purveyors of emergency climate change. This is why, because they're true believers, they're glazed, they're manic. So it doesn't matter how many independent scientists say this is not happening, this is rubbish. It doesn't matter because they don't count. They're not on TV. They don't get the space. This is where you get a sort of rather backward Swedish teenager on, on the stage with King Charles and yes. on the stage with mm -hmm. presidents and everybody else.
it's really, it's frankly actually pathetic. It makes you wonder, it makes you wonder what's gone wrong in these people's lives. What's missing in their life right. mm -hmm. that they that they do this? Now, it's a difficult nut to crack, isn't it? It's a difficult mm -hmm. problem to push back against when you're dealing with irrationality on a monster scale. <laughs> I even have followers who are otherwise very, very intelligent, common sense guys <clears throat> on my Twitter feed and all that kind of stuff who've bought into this, who've bought into this. And uh, so my website now, I've done the same as I did for COVID. It's a massive independent website pages <clears throat> with contributions from people who are genuine scientists who actually know what they're talking about, who've got all the statistics, uh, they've got all the data, and it's there for anybody who wants to see. And it was the same with COVID three years ago. But it seems that some people don't want to press the button. I've done all the work. Yes. <laughs> I've okay. done the work. They don't have to do any work. All they have to do is press a button and just read. And mm -hmm. it's independent. It's independent scientists. It's the same with my COVID website. You're not allowed on if you're a politician. And you're mm -hmm. not allowed if you're paid by the government. And you're certainly not allowed if you're paid by Big Pharma. You're not paid by Big Pharma. And I'm very reluctant to put uh, academics on <clears throat> for the simple reason that they are part of deep state. Another wonderful American phrase. Uh, no, you will lose your chair. You will lose your faculty job if you question yes. the climate change rhetoric at Cambridge or Oxford or mm -hmm. Durham. Or oh, you'll lose you'll lose your job if you try and explain what a woman is. This is how bad it's got. You know what is a woman? Yeah. Like, I need notice of the question. Yeah. I heard that a senior shadow cabinet minister the other day when he was asked, what is a woman? It was incidentally, it was on GB News, I think. Well, okay. what is a woman? He said, I'd need written notice of that question. Oh, really? I did not hear that. Uh, yeah, did... unbelievable. How do they ever get a shag? How do they ever get a shag? <laughs> That's a gr great point. Uh, I did have a question about uh, what do you think is going to happen uh, in terms of uh, rationality coming back to... Brit, uh, Britain, your neck of the woods, and uh, are they ever going to start burning that coal again? Is List Trust going to uh, help out here so that they're uh, going to stop hauling wood all the way from Louisiana or wherever it is? is that, no, is this, that... Is, this is the problem. They've all committed to net zero. Okay. <clears throat> net zero carbon dioxide emission. They've 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 committed to it. Even Liz Trust, even when people can't afford to heat their homes, and in Switzerland you can go to prison if you set your dial above 66 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? You go to prison if you set your set through the winter above 66. What kind of world are we living in with these people? And instead of saying, oh my goodness me, didn't we make a, a balls of that? Net zero. Gosh, we've got to stop doing that, didn't we? Got rid of all our coal. Uh, we, we stopped fracking. We're not allowed to frack and we've got all that gas. You'd have thought that's the route they'd go, but no, we're, they're sticking with net zero. And everybody, the working men, your sparkies, your your chippies, mm. they're all going, what's she snorting? Okay. She's yeah. got to be snorting something, mm. hasn't she? To not realise that they we're in this mess. You can blame Putin all you like. Mm. This was happening well before Putin. Yeah. Well they, before Putin. They were still uh, blowing up fossil fuel power plants very recently. Is that true? Yeah. You heard some yeah, we had bang the other day. So with this energy crunch looming, they're still doing that. That, that blows yeah. my mind there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. They have actually said they're going to take away the ban on fracking. Okay. That, that, right. that, that is one concession that they made, but yeah. nobody understands why they put it on. Uh, but the Greenies, who get lots of airtime, Friends of the Earth, fake pseudo charities, mm -hmm. they come on TV and they, they cause earthquakes and they pollute the water course. Okay. And people go, is, where is somebody to say, no, that isn't true? Where's a top engineer mm -hmm. who's an expert in fracking from America right. or even Russia, you know, who are doing this. And though there yeah. isn't a problem with the water course, there aren't ca causing earthquakes. Right. It doesn't desecrate yeah. the land. Why isn't anybody talking about wind turbines, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which don't work? We've had a lovely summer. The wind turbines haven't been turning here for nearly a month. There's been no electricity oh, okay. generated mm -hmm. by wind turbines. Think of all the concrete you need, the yes. copper, yes. the fiberglass, yes. all the stuff you need to build a wind turbine which at the moment is producing probably no more than 2% of mm -hmm. our energy in this mm -hmm. country. They disfigure the landscape. They disfigure the seascape. There's no system for dismantling them. They, mm -hmm. We don't know what to do with the blades, which are fiberglass, which yes. won't mm -hmm. biodegrade. Mm -hmm. Nobody's talking about this. 
But hey, landowners are making millions a year out of these. Yes. Now, the Prime Minister Cameron, David Cameron's father-in-law, Lord Sheffield, wrong, Sir Reginald Sheffield, owns land the other side of the Humber to me, just across the way. Now, he's got something like about 15 wind turbines, which are bringing him something like a million and a half or two million pounds a year. Okay. So he's doing very nicely. So what does Cameron want? More wind turbines are good, aren't they? Guess who makes more money than anybody out of wind turbines uh, in the mm. whole world? Uh, and that's uh, King Charles. Oh, King Charles okay. III. Yeah. Because it's offshore. All the offshore wind turbines are crown land. I did not know that. Yeah. I think War- Warren Buffett over here, I think uh, his Berkshire Hathaway is one of the biggest uh, wind farm uh, subsidy <laughs> farmers. Rationality yeah. Yeah. Isn't, is simply isn't there, it, which almost leaves the chaps like us punching air a bit. <clears throat> it's very difficult to deal with irrationality, even yes. if you get airspace. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you're allowed to put the data on the screen, which we're not allowed to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. So we have the blog. <clears throat> and every now and again, I get a viral that goes into millions and millions, but it's normally yeah. some emotional rhetoric that, I, that I've used because I'm really angry. Yeah. At <laughs> two gypsies broke into a guy's house in London two years ago, threatened him. His wife was ill in bed upstairs. He wasn't a young man either. Uh, and they were very nasty guys with previous records of, for crime. He very bravely oh. took a kitchen knife or something out of the drawer mm. in his kitchen and stabbed one of them. Oh. Good riddance. Mm-hmm. The police turned up and arrested him mm-hmm. and held him for two <clears throat> for two days, knowing that the guy he killed was a, a, a recidivist criminal. It was absolutely disgraceful. Yes. It couldn't mm-hmm. happen in America, of course, but it can happen here. I hope not. Where yeah. we have a very mm-hmm. vague thing called a, a reasonable force. Mm-hmm. I was so bloody incensed about it. <clears throat> I waved my old regimental sword in the air to the camera and said, anybody breaks into my house at two o'clock in the morning, you'll get this. You'll nice. get this. Be warned. <laughs> and that got 25 million views. Really? Okay. 25 million. I have to look that one up. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know that's the kind of thing everybody yeah. could empathize with that yes they? yes break into my house and i'll bloody kill you too everybody okay. loved that okay so and i will and i would <laughs> yeah good for you i think we are making some inroads and i'm happy on twitter here i'm seeing it seems like there's a lot more people who are well informed that are pushing back so i think there is some reason for optimism i think for skeptics yeah, yes yeah I'm, we mustn't be yeah. too yeah uh, unoptimistic um yeah. And of course, the thing is, maybe they haven't taken any interest in climate. Maybe they're not interested. Maybe they haven't checked websites. Maybe they haven't watched people like you on TV and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, when they get their bills, yes, when they get their bills, Mm -hmm. they'll start then saying, just a minute, because it's actually come through their door, come through their letterbox. Mm -hmm. And then they might just say, what is it? Just a minute. Is any of this true? Is it bullshit? And they'll start Mm -hmm. looking. And I think that will grow. People yes. don't like having their pockets picked. Yep. Yeah. Now, this can't go on forever. It's going to end at some point. I just don't know when. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. And of course, what she's going to do is she's she put a cap on. <clears throat> she's going to print money to give to the power companies to keep bills for people below a certain level. Mm, okay. And of course, it comes back to finance again. Mm. You know, it's my subject. Yes. yes. <clears throat> There are still enough people who still believe that you can print money without degrading it. And they're all in government and they're all in the central banks. Okay. <clears throat> they think you can turn the handle and print money without it degrading money. And it's Keynesian economy, which is taught at universities, both sides mm. of the pond. Everybody okay. believes it. it's, it's been called modern monetary theory, but it's Keynesian. We've seen it all before. Yes. Okay. You cannot print money without degrading money. Now, the question is, I'd like to see somebody in TV ask these central bankers or ask the Prime Minister, ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the Fed, whomsoever, say, if printing money is a good idea and it's okay and it does not going to degrade it and so on and so forth, why can't we all have a little machine in our attic, all right? And then every time we run short of money, we pop upstairs and print some more. Right. Because that's the natural extension mm. of your thinking, it is. isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> but why is it only good for the Fed or the Bank of England? 
or the ECB, but not you and me. Why can't you and me do it? Great question. That really uh, points out what a farce the whole thing is. But uh, I can't believe anybody believes you can just print money and it's uh, not going to degrade anything. It's amazing. How can they think that? They're they taught that in college, are they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. I've, lectured at, yeah. I've lectured at major universities up and down the country, lecturing Austrian school economics. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And this encapsulates the whole thing. I was at Newcastle University, uh, where I was president of the uh, Free Trade Association for, for a few years. <clears throat> it was packed. I always speak to big houses, packed houses, because the kids are getting something new. Uh, and, and, and they like something new. What, I haven't heard this. Now, here's an interesting point, which encapsulates the whole thing, sums it all up. Okay. I was advocating Austrian school economics. I was talking about Murray Rothbard, von Mises, uh, Karl Meng, all these people uh, in, in this field. <clears throat> and a guy came up to me. He was a third year economics undergraduate, third year. He said, why have I never heard of these people? He said, I knew you were speaking tonight and I thought I'd come along because it'd be interesting. And I spoke to my professor and I said, why have I been here for nearly three years? I've never heard of any of these people. And do you know what the professor said? No, oh, what? This is bloody amazing. He said, if you wanted to know about Menger and Mises, Murray Rothbard and Hayek and so on and so forth, you should have applied to join a philosophy course. Really? Not, not either. He, the, the professor didn't believe they had anything to do with economics uh, at all. Huh. It is astonishing, isn't it? It is. And the one guy, I helped him with his dissertation. Um, he, he came to me and, you know, and I said, well, I just put a few Austrian things. You have to be very careful because the guy was going to get badly graded because he got a Keynesian marking his paper. All right. Okay. Yeah. Keynesian marking his paper. So you have to be box a bit clever. Anyway, he came back with red ink on it. And he showed me what the guy knows. And I said, now, I said, what I can tell you is this man is not an economist. He said at the head of the Newcastle University Economics Department, I said, whatever, not because he disagrees with me or he's not an Austrian school or Chicago school mm -hmm. or Keynes. Leave all that aside. I can tell you he's not an economist by his comments. And he said, well, what do I do? And he said, go back and ask him. What, what did he graduate? Okay. He said, I can't do that. I said, well, find out, somehow find out. And he came back to me and said, no, he's not an economist. He didn't graduate an economist at all. He's not an really? economist. No, okay. he bullshitted his way. He bullshitted his way into being head of the economic faculty. Really? But that's because that's because <clears throat> the big the, the top of the faculties, the dons at Oxford and Cambridge, the top people don't regard economic, they regard it as you know black magic. They don't regard it. And they they assess people as well if you want an economics course but they say ah oh, you've got to be fairly good at mathematics because it's got a high mathematical content now one thing economics has nothing to do with is mathematics it's got nothing as mises said it's human action mm, okay you cannot put a program into a computer and judging how people are going to behave if this this and this happens mm. you simply can't do it so there shouldn't be any mathematics at all <clears throat> you can have psychology uh, you can have uh, all sorts of other things, statistics, <clears throat> but what you can't do is have mathematics. You can't have a mathematical mm -hmm. program. <clears throat> uh, otherwise, you'll get you'll get a meaningless answer. You'll get the wrong answer every single time. Brings us back to Neil Ferguson, Imperial College, always mm -hmm. wrong. You think, wouldn't you, if you were a professor <clears throat> at a university and you're always wrong, wouldn't you go down the garden with a dog and have a walk and have a bit of a think? You go, just a minute. I'm mm -hmm. always wrong. Right. Perhaps I need to have a reassessment here of, of my career. But, but no, they don't, do they? No penalty for being wrong, I guess, huh? No, no. not in the university life. No. Nobody ever got sacked for being wrong. You can get sacked for <clears throat> suggesting Britain isn't a racist society, which is certainly it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get sacked for saying that bloke with the beard uh, in a dress is a woman because he right. says he's a woman. You, yeah. you, you can get sacked for all sorts of things, mm -hmm. but not, uh, but not actually being consistently wrong about your own profession. I don't think America is any different. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Um, okay, I don't want to keep you for too long. Uh, do you have any uh, any more uh, summing up or anything else you'd like to cover? I think this has been super interesting for me. Uh, well, if I could uh, encourage people to visit my website. Yes. Uh, which is very easy. It's just Godfrey Bloom Small Case dot UK. Yeah. It's okay. very easy. 
and your find on climate change a lot now. I've only been six months building this. Okay. The COVID thing uh, was is three years in the making. Uh, this is only six, but it's still got quite a lot of good stuff. And every time I see good stuff or good graphics or good data, it gets posted up there. Okay. Uh, and it's all good stuff. And it doesn't come from politicians. It doesn't come from celebrities. Nothing to do with Harrison Ford. Uh, you know, you get real people on it and you can learn a lot from it and it's relatively easy to understand it's all in color color graphics okay. and the all same right. with my book if i can plug my book the sure. magic of banking um which you can uh, have a look at it's on the under books on my website um the idea of that book is non-profit making it's a non-profit making uh, game for me okay. um to try and explain <clears throat> to the intelligent layman what's happening in the world of finance and money and fiat currencies try and explain it to him he knows he's being con the mat joe sixpack knows he's being con yep and this <clears throat> should help him it's not a big book you can read it in an hour and a bit it's a good little reference work with its graphics and i think you'll find that it people find it very useful in fact one guy contacted me he was a wall street wall street broker and he said, I've just read your book and it just filled up the time I travel into uh, Wall Street and back. It just filled the time in nicely and, and, and I, I read it. He said, I've learned a lot. He said, I've been a Wall Street broker mm -hmm. for years. He said, I learned loads that I didn't know. <clears throat> it is a must read for any financial journalist because there's one thing as a genre, financial journalists are all incredibly stupid. Okay. Incredibly right. stupid, mind bogglingly stupid and ignorant uh so i would recommend if you've got a but you won't have any uh journalists following this because they're all cut from the same cloth aren't they you never they're know I'm not sure <laughs> never know uh, so can we get to your facebook also from your your website that you mentioned or you have a pretty good, yes. big following out there yes. right facebook. Okay. um yeah i get a big follow i've got about a hundred thousand yeah. followers yeah. but uh, okay if it's uh, yeah it's all there for people can pick and choose pick and mix what they want want to look at and I normally respond if somebody says you're wrong on this or that's interesting or could you just suggest this or can you guide me onto something else? Uh, you're pretty sure to get a response okay. sooner or later. All right. Very good. Okay. So, yeah, thank you very much for uh, taking the time here. I've really enjoyed this and I hope you can come on the podcast again sometime. Well, it's been a pleasure and thank you for inviting me. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Godfrey Bloom. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.